So let's look at uh, these two accounts. The first account is Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 22 to 26. Scripture says, Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. Um, so right, I'll read it first, then we'll comment. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he, Jesus, sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell anyone, nor tell anyone in the town. So this is a very interesting account here. Um, initially, it seems that Jesus is not... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, they come up to our Lord Jesus with this blind man, and they beg him to touch him. So it seems as if our Lord is actually reluctant to, to affect the healing. We think, well, you know what can that be? Because, Lord, you are always wanting to heal people. No, and Jesus did always want to heal people, without a doubt. But Jesus also recognized that unless you came to him in faith, even though he was fully anointed with the power of God, he couldn't force the power of God into your body. You had to receive it by faith. He was the power source, but you couldn't touch that power source in curiosity and expect power to flow. It wouldn't work. You had to touch the power source, and I know it's, that sounds a bit weird to say it like that, but I'm trying to get the concept across. You had to touch that wire, so to speak, in faith in order for the electricity to flow. And so that, so Jesus recognized that. And in this case here, our Lord recognizes this man's faith is not at a point where he expects to receive from me when I touch him. And so that's why our, there's a bit of a reluctance on our Lord's part. Now there's other issues around this as well. And we can pick it up because of we see it in the passage. They come to our Lord and they beg Him to touch Him. So they're almost looking at this as if this, He's a magician. You know, just touch this guy and He's going to be healed. And he's going to be, he's going to be, his eyes will be opened up. Now the, the blind man himself is not overly sure about this whole thing and Jesus is picking that up so he's not whole, he's not really operating in faith the the people that have brought this guy to Jesus are also just bringing him to because they are a curiosity they are thinking it's more like a magic thing you know just touch him and he'll be fine and so there's no real faith there and so what Jesus has to do there's a couple of things Jesus has to do to overcome the problem because now you know, he, 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 wants, he has compassion, he wants to heal the guy. But he knows that if he just put his hand on... Had, he, had Jesus done what 99.9% .9 of Christians do today? When people bring a blind man to the Christian today, they say, won't you please lay your hands on him so that can, the person can be healed. We would lay our hands, pray, be healed in Jesus' name, a very short little prayer now, um, and nothing would happen in this circumstance. Why is that? Because the person standing before us who is blind is not really in faith to receive from us. And also the people that are bringing him are not really believing. They're there out of curiosity. They're not there out of faith. But because most Christians are not really perceptive to the situation as Jesus was, we would just put our hands up, lay hands on the guy, pray in faith on our part, but nothing would happen. And, you know, the guy would walk away blind, and we would just say, well, you know, you, you win some, you lose some. That one we lost. Jesus doesn't operate like that if he can avoid it, um, because he prefers to get results, because he knows how to get results. But ha again, how had Jesus behaved like most Christians and just put his, and put his hands out and said, be healed, and touched his eyes, nothing would have happened. The guy would have walked away from Jesus, still blind, and those curiosity on onlookers would have said, well, you know, his magic's not working today. Um, so Jesus has to overcome the problem. So how does he do that? He does it in two ways. Firstly, he removes the individual from the, the environment of unbelief because he takes him out of the town. Um, the scripture says in verse 23, 
So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Now we know that he doesn't allow anybody from the town to follow him because in verse 26, after he's healed, uh, Jesus sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. And so, you know, Jesus could have said that to him because none of the town knew what had happened. Why didn't they know? Because they weren't present when Jesus healed him. And so they were all present when the man was brought to Jesus. But when Jesus healed him, they weren't there anymore. Now, why is that? Jesus prevented them. He used his disciples to, Peter, James, John, keep the guys back. I don't want anybody to follow me. I'm taking this guy out by myself outside of the town. I'll deal with him myself. And so, because he did that, he did that when uh, he uh, wanted to raise the Talita from the dead. He's, he got his disciples to keep the, keep the crowds away, and he went on his own with the, the, the father and Peter, James, and John he took with him to the house. But the rest, he wouldn't let them follow. And so we learned something here from our Lord Jesus, that in an environment of unbelief, it hinders the power of God from being released. So it's not only the individual who's receiving. Look, when the individual who's receiving is full of faith, even when there's unbelief out there, the, uh, the power of God will flow. But this individual was not full of faith coming to the Lord. So our Lord had to deal with him, but our Lord also had to then deal with all of the unbelief in the crowd. And so he, he, he takes the guy out of that unbel unbelieving environment because all of it is not conducive to the power of God being released. And so Jesus has to overcome these hurdles. First thing he does is he removes the person from the environment of unbelief, takes him out of the town. Now when he takes him out of the town, our Lord doesn't then just lay hands on him. Our Lord goes the extra mile because he recognizes this guy needs some help to release his faith. Because faith, um, a very crude analogy, but it actually does work. Faith is like a light switch. The, when, when, we've, when the switch is on, our faith is working. When the switch is off, our doubt is working. And so in order for um, the power of God to be released, we have to have the on switch on. We, in other words, we must push with the, the switch on the faith button. Because most people operate in the doubt button, which is the off, off switch. And so no power can flow. Faith is the on switch. And so Jesus needs to get him to activate his faith. Now Jesus recognizes this guy's not operating in, in a high degree of faith, he's in fact had very little faith. Um, so if I just touch him with my hands, that's not going to be enough for him to receive the power of God. So Jesus goes the extra mile, what does he do? And then he spit on his eyes and put his hands on him. And he asked him. And so our Lord uses spittle. Now spittle has the, the effect of, of flowing on the, on the guy's eyes. The guy can feel it. And so our Lord is doing, he's gone the extra mile to get this guy to release his faith. And even when Jesus does all that, okay, so he takes him out of the unbelieving environment, he takes him and then he, he spits on his eyes and he lays hands on him and he speaks to him. Even in that, and all that Jesus has done, the guy doesn't receive this full healing because what our Lord says to him, um, can you see anything? And he looked at him and said, I see men like trees walking. So he has partial sight restored. And so our Lord goes back and lays hands on him again. The scripture says that he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And so our Lord did it once again to release and let him experience the full uh, healing of his eyes. And then he could see clearly. And so this, this incident of healing took our Lord a bit of time to do. And he had to overcome certain uh, hindrances, hurdles, really. He had to get rid of the unbelieving environment. He had to then help the guy by get, to go in the extra mile, using his spittle on the guy's eyes and his hands. And even in doing that, the guy could only get partially healed. And so the Lord prayed again. And so we learned from our Lord in this, that you know, not always are we going to get instant results. And we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and just you know, common sense, I think, in a way. Because I think you know, Jesus, although he was led by the Spirit and he knew what the, the situation was, you know, we also need to know, is the person who's standing before me standing here in faith? And is this environment conducive? You know, is, and not just go in and lay hands. If we want to get results, we're going to sometimes have to listen to the Holy Spirit and go the extra mile. Spittle, the Holy Spirit might say, 
This is anything is really going to get this guy to release his faith. Spit in his eyes. No, that's not the way to work, but that's what our Lord used. Um, and so you recall there was a other time the guy had to wash, you know, our Lord made clay of the spittle and put it on his eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam and you'll come back see. So God has to sometimes do extra things for people to be able to release their faith. And that's what the laying of hands is all about. Because remember, our, our Lord spoke about great faith and it was through the word of God. Lord, you don't only speak the word. I'm talking about the centurion and his servant. You only need to speak the word. Uh, my servant will be healed. And our Lord said, that's great faith. Um, because the guy was prepared to receive from God just by the word of God. But God recognizes some people need to have a tangible touch. And so he employs this method called the laying of hands. But even the, through the laying of hands, sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes we have to do something else over and above that in order to get the person to receive. And so that's that account. Let's look at the other account of a person being delivered from a demonic oppression, or possession in this case, and also taking a bit of time. It didn't happen instantly. Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 13. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately they met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Verse 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Tor torment me sorry. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. And our large herd of swine was feeding near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down to the, down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. And so this is also another account where our Lord had to take time to get this individual delivered. Now, Jesus was acting out of his compassion here. This guy hadn't been praying to the Lord for deliverance. Uh, this guy was completely possessed by the, the demon's name was Legion. Uh, legion had taken possession of the person. The 2,000 demons were just the guests that the Legion invited into this body. So this poor individual was completely demon-possessed, had no free will anymore. And so couldn't go to Jesus and ask for deliverance because you know, this demon just ran his life. Jesus knew about it. God the Father wanted him to go there and deliver this guy. So Jesus goes over and now he proceeds to deliver the guy. Now what happens in this instance is that when our Lord comes to the other side and the guy comes up to him, the first thing that Jesus does is he rebukes the unclean spirit and he commands the spirit to come out. But the demon doesn't come out because have a look at the, what happened here. Um, verse 7, and he, cried, okay, and, and he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you that you do not torment me. Verse 8, for he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And so Jesus first commands the spirit to come out of the man. The, the, the demon then doesn't come out. The demon replies to the Lord by shouting, crying out like this, what have I to do with you, son of Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you, do not torment me. So now, so that's how it's taken place. The, 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 the demon guy, Jesus has got out of the boat. The guy who's possessed by the demon runs up to Jesus. Jesus obviously knows he's demon-possessed. Demons, yeah. Jesus speaks to the demon straight away. He tells him, come out of him, you unclean spirit. The demon doesn't come out. The demon then speaks to Jesus and makes that comment. What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, you do not torment me. So now Jesus recognizes, okay, this is a different demon. I've got to deal with this guy differently because he hasn't, I've commanded him to come out and the demon has not come out. So what does Jesus do next? Scripture says, he then asked him, what is your name? So, we're learning something here. Our Lord is teaching us about casting out demons. Most cases we've seen in Scripture, Jesus just cast them out with the word and they left. A lot of, a lot of the times there was tearing and screaming and shouting from the demon, but they just left then eventually. Um, but in this case, not. In this case, Jesus commands the unclean, unclean spirit to come out. He doesn't. He replies back to the Lord. And when he speaks to the Lord, he uses the man's voice because he's taken full possession of the man. So the man is speaking to Jesus. 
those who are with Jesus, including the shepherds of the, uh, I don't know if you call them shepherds, the guys that are looking after the pigs, they also hear this discourse. So they hear the conversation between the man and Jesus. They don't recognize that it's a demon using the man's voice. Jesus does, obviously. So Jesus recognizes, okay, I've got to do something different here because this guy's not coming out. So he says, what's your name? And so we learn something here. You know, sometimes it may be necessary, if the demon does not obey the first time, to find out what the demon's name is. For Jesus asked him, what's your name? So he gives him his name. He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now he doesn't tell Jesus how many there are in there, but many is a lot. Because there were 2,000 pigs and they went into the 2,000 and killed the pigs. So there was over 2,000 demons in them. And so at that time, um, the scripture says, and he, he also begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now that's a bit of a, a blind uh, interpretation for us because Luke's account says that he wouldn't send him into the abyss. So it wasn't that, that the demon didn't want to leave the Gadarenes because they liked the scenery, not at all. They were concerned that Jesus would um, cast them into the bottomless pit. Um, and Jesus didn't do that because we can't do that at this time. And Jesus knew that. They didn't know that. And so they you know, asked him not to send him uh, out of the, the country. And then something else happens now. In verse 12 it says, So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter them. And so there's this discourse taking place. Now the discourse moves from the natural into the spiritual. Because what, what happens now is not Legion doesn't speak to Jesus through his voice anymore of the man. Now all the demons... Uh, big start big in Jesus. Now, we, how do they do that? They do it in the spirit. Jesus is operating the gifts of, the, of discerning of spirits. And so, discerning of spirits is hearing and seeing in the spirit realm. And so, Jesus hears the demon speaking to him in the spirit realm. No one else hears that. Only Jesus hears that. And so, when they cry out and they say, send us into the swine, Jesus said, okay, you can do that. And when he says that, now, to, think about it. You, you're watching the sidelines and you're hearing the discourse between the, the demon-possessed man and Jesus, because you can hear all of that conversation. Um, you hear the last thing that, the, that comes out of the man's mouth is, My name is Legion, for we are many. And you hear him begging that Jesus would not cast him into the abyss. That's what you hear. Then you hear Jesus say, um, I give you permission to go into this one. Now, people standing by looking, saying, well, why did he do that? Because we didn't hear this guy saying that. Um, because Jesus heard the demon saying that. And Jesus recognized that he had to come to a compromise. Um, it's, it, it, obviously, it had to be a compromise. Because if there were no compromise, Jesus would have not allowed the demons to go into the swine. Jesus would have said, no, you, get, you, you leave this body. I come on, you to get, get out of this body right now. Um, we would say that in Jesus' name. Obviously, Jesus wouldn't say in Jesus' name. But Jesus comes to a compromise with these demons. We don't know why. We don't know the circumstances around this individual becoming demon-possessed. We just meet him in Scripture once he is fully possessed by the demon. And so it seems to have been that there was some ground of legal ground that the demons had for residing in that body. And so the only way Jesus can now overcome this problem is he has to come to the compromise. They are, they are wanting, they recognize they've got to come out, um, but they're standing their ground for whatever reason, or we don't know. Um, and so the compromise they're prepared to come up with is, all right, we'll come out of this guy. It might be that if they had come out of him, the guy would die because they would have been allowed to kill him when they left. I don't know. Um, if Jesus does come up with this compromise. Well, he didn't. They did. Jesus allowed it. They said, okay, we'll come out of the guy, but we want to go into the swine. Now, they didn't recognize, they don't understand, or didn't understand at that time, that they can't enter into an animal. God doesn't allow that. Jesus didn't know that. So Jesus was quite, okay, that's fine. You can go into the animal. Because he knew that the, the, the swine would then commit suicide, basically. <laughs> Animals are really wise. They know if there's a demon in me, that's it, I'm out of here. And they'll, they'll kill themselves rather than carry on the bed. And that's exactly what happens. And then the demons were out on their own anyway. Because once the pigs died, well, then the demons were out there. They, you know, they've got to try to find somebody else they can get into. But the whole point is, this took time. 
This didn't happen instantly. There, was ish, there were hurdles that Jesus had to overcome in order to effect this deliverance. And we will have to learn from our Lord Jesus uh, around this. It's not always when we are praying for somebody is there going to be an instant deliverance. Sometimes there's going to be time that we have to take in getting the person healed or delivered. And we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit to follow His leading and guidance in this. Now, we also seem to think because Jesus was the Son of God, He was fully anointed by God. Yes, He was. But there was another reason around it, because Jesus came to the earth as the Son of Man. So, in Philippians, He said He laid aside His, and one translation says, His mighty power and glory, and humbled Himself, became as a man. Um, um, and so, when Jesus came to the earth, He came with no power of His own. Just like we have no power of our own, Jesus had no power of His own. He was fully reliant on the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, when Jesus ministered, when he entered into his ministry after he was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and in water, should I say, and then filled with the Holy Spirit, um, Jesus was fully reliant on the power of God being made manifest through him. He didn't have any power of his own. So, before Jesus came to the earth, he had power. Um, you know, Jesus could do all the stuff that God does. When he came to the earth, he could still do all the stuff that God does, but he was reliant on the power of God being made manifest through him to do that. And he had no power of his own. He was just a man. And so Jesus had to um, rely on the power of God to flow through him. Now, it didn't flow through him automatically because he was the Son of God. Because he was the Son of God, but he was also, he was walking this earth as the Son of Man. And so Jesus had to make certain interventions in his life in order for the power of God to flow through him. It wasn't an automatic process. And we pick that up um, in, in, in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. The scripture says, Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And so Jesus was made just like us. He had no inherent power in his body. And so had the Holy Spirit not been in Jesus and, and the power not been there, if you came to Jesus to, to be healed by him and touched him, nothing would have happened because there was no power there. Okay? Jesus could have healed you by his faith. Um, you know, he could have prayed for you and God would have answered that prayer. But no transference of anointing of power would have gone from Jesus to you because he didn't have it until he was full of the Holy Spirit. Now he had the power of God. And so we just need to understand that Jesus' vessel, his physical body, was just like ours. We don't have any power of our own. It's the power of God. Jesus didn't have any power of his own. It was the power of God. Now in order for the power of God to flow in Jesus' life, he had to do the Psalm 35, 13 to 14. This is Jesus speaking about his life on the earth when he was on the earth as his ministry. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. I, passed, I, I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. Jesus prayed for the anointing of God to flow through his life. And he fasted. He prayed and he fasted to have the power of God flowing through his body to be able to heal the others. He said, I prayed for them as though they were my friends and brothers. So Jesus didn't know the people that he was praying for. I know he was their creator, but as the Jesus the man, he didn't know them. And so he prayed for them when he, went, when he was on his own, and he fasted that the power of God would be made manifest through him. And it was. Tremendously. Tremendous power flowed through him. And so if Jesus had to pray and fast in order to for the power of God to flow through his, his life as the spotless Son of God, we are no different. We're going to have to do exactly the same. And so prayer and fasting has the effect of increasing the anointing in our, in our lives. And um, I'm going to end the teaching on that point today, and we'll carry on with the, this, this topic of what is the land of hands in the next teaching. We'll end the teaching on that point now. Amen.